Protectors of the Sunnah. Sunnah Baba. Protector of the Sunnah. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل وسلم وعلى نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته الحمد لله الله سبحانه وتعالى once again has decreed for us to be together to talk about this wonderful beautiful topic about the life of our beloved Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and in this um this journey We've also come to learn about our beautiful, our heroes, the Sahaba, and also having a better understanding of verses from the Quran. <clears throat> and remember what we said from the very beginning is that we have, we should have a better understanding that when we come across particular verses, by going through um, the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala was revealing verses from the Quran. Regarding situations that was going on with the Muslims, there was such a that about the Battle of Uhud, the Battle of Badr, the situation dealing with Munafikin. These are the people who acted like they were Muslim, and um, and they really hated Islam and tried to destroy it from within. Uh, the last uh, time that we uh, had our class, we talked about the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, which was a basically a peace accord between the Muslims and the Quraysh. And it was going on for it's supposed to go for ten years, and in this particular time, Islam was able to flourish because they were able to give dawa, and it was uninterrupted, like it before it would be interrupted. The Quraysh would cause them an issue, and it would be interrupted. And so, what happens is that Islam is now growing exponentially because of the fact with this particular treaty, and so what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has also done is that now the message of Islam is coming outside of the Arabian Peninsula. It's going to people who are um, in the Persian Empire, people who are part of the Byzantine Empire, the people who are part of Abyssinian uh, Empire, and other little offshoots, um, Oman, Qatar, um, all of these different, Bahrain, I'm sorry, not Qatar, but Bahrain, Oman, all of these places now the Muslims are going and they're delivering the Prophet Sallallahu message to these individuals about accepting Islam and following him as the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so Alhamdulillah, um, bringing us to today's um, class, the conflict between the Quraysh and the Muslims were um, was pretty much at an even um, kill. And what would happen is that the Munafi king, they could not, they had to be even more um, stealth in their approach in terms of trying to destroy Islam. So the Muslims had already dealt with Banu Quraitha and Banu Nadir. These were Jewish tribes that had lived in Medina probably for centuries. And they were run out of um, the Byzantine Empire, because those the Byzantine Empire were Christians and they hated and abhorred Jews. And so they kicked them out of or they ran them out of those areas. And those particular tribes ended up settling in northern Medina. And in that situation, they hated the Prophet Wasallam because, number one, he messed their money up. They, they were able to benefit a great deal off of the Aus and the Khazraj, these two tribes who have been fighting each other for so long, um, they were able to benefit because they would provide finances for these wars that they would have with each other. So now the fact that the Muslims are brothers in Islam, the Aus and the Khazraj are brothers in Islam, and the fact that they were racist because they felt that the prophet was supposed to come from their line. And the fact that it came from the line of Ismail, even though the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had fulfilled all of the requirements in their book, then it was a situation of they were just going to reject it 
and they did everything that they could by financing the, the Quraysh with uh, supplies to fight the Muslims in terms of trying any type of um, Arab tribe in the vicinity. They always encouraged them to fight the Muslims, cause the Muslims any type of problem, so on and so forth. So the Muslims had dealt with Battle Quraidah after the Battle of the Trench. This is when the uh, Quraysh in about three, uh, it was about 3,000, it was more than that, where they basically a confederacy um, was had come together in order to try to march on Medina and destroy Islam for good. And so, alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed that plan. And the Banu Quraidah, which was a Jewish tribe whom had betrayed the Muslims, okay? So they betrayed their contract with the, the Prophet sallallahu And so now that we have uh, Haiba. And Haiba was even somewhat more of a threat than Banu Quraidah. They were very rich. They were very powerful. And they said their village um, had forts. They were like, like castles almost. So they had castles and they had farms. And it was about 60 to 80 miles north of Medina. So they didn't live really um, close to the Prophet Wasallam and the Muslims. But they still had this relationship with the Arabs. And they even had alliances. So you might have had Battle Quraidah, who might have been um, aligned with um, with Aus, uh, Aus tribe, Battle Nadir may have been with Khazraj, so on and so forth. So they had these alliances with the Arabs, but they didn't really respect them anyway. So Haybar was a place of great wealth. Um, it had some fierce fighters in there, and they were enemies to Islam. So this wasn't like the Muslims were going and messing with them for no reason. They hated Islam, and they did everything that they could in order to cause the Muslims a problem. So now that the Quraysh is, um, is, is we, they don't have to worry about that anymore. Now they get the Prophet Islam can concentrate on all of these other threats that have been looming in the air against them, and now the Prophet Islam was going to deal with Haiba. And so um, it said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals a verse in the Quran where Allah says, Allah has promised you abundant spoils and that you will capture and he um, and He has hastened for uh, for you this. And this is, a lot of scholars say that this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that they were going to be um, victorious and taken haybar. So the hypocrites, when they heard about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam getting ready to um, march on the people in Khaybar, of course, no other than Abdullah ibn Ubay and other hypocrites um, made an effort to go and warn the people in Khaybar about the Muslims coming. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this in the Quran, A'udhu billahi min shaitan al-rajim, those who lag behind will say, when you set, um, set forth to take the spoils, allow us to follow you. They want to change Allah's, um, Allah's word, say, you shall not follow us. Thus, Allah has said beforehand, then they will say, nay, you envy us, nay. But they understand, not accept a little. And so the Prophet Wasallam learned his lesson in terms of taking these people with him the one time. Because remember, in the Battle of Uhud, they withdrew their forces in order to cause a Muslim a problem in their heart. Right. So they withdrew like 300 of the forces. And so every time and then in the battle of, of the Khandaq, the trench, they would they left that battle, too. And they had an excuse for that. OK. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did or the Prophet sallam, did not allow them to come on this campaign. OK. So um, the Prophet sallallahu sallam, only invited those who was willing to fight for the cause of Allah to accompany it. Uh, on this journey. So this wasn't like um, the the other vicious battles where it was basically all hands on deck. The Prophet Sallallahu gave them an option. So listen, whoever want to roll with me, come on. So it was 1,400 of the Muslims um, that had responded to the call of going and marching on Haber. So another incident as a side note is that our famous, beloved, 
Sahabi becomes Muslim around this time, and it is no other than Abu Hurairah, radiallahu an. Everybody, if anybody knows or every read hadith, you see Abu Hurairah's name all over the hadith, all over the different hadiths or whatever that he narrated. So around this time, just as a side note, this is around the time when Abu Hurairah ends up accepting Islam. So this is around the seventh year of Hijri. So it's subhanAllah, it's interesting to me that he didn't become Muslim sooner. But alhamdulillah, he becomes Muslim around this time, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevate his station because what he was able to contribute has been of a uh, beautiful um, a treasure for us. And so um, the hypocrites um, took notice, and like I said before, they had warned the Jews that the, the Muslims were coming, and uh it's been narrated on the authority of Salama bin al-Aqwa, who said, we marched upon the Kaaba with, uh, with the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we journeyed during the night. One of them, uh, one of them, the men said to the brother, Amir, won't you recite some of your verses? Amir. So he began to chant his verses to urge the camels to reciting, O oh Allah, if you had not guided us, we would have neither been rightly guided nor practiced charity nor offered prayers. We wish to lay down our lives for you. So forgive, uh, so forgive you our lapses and keep us steadfast when we encounter our, our enemies. Bestow upon us peace and tranquility. Behold, when, uh, when with a cry they, they call upon us to help. So on a way down the valley, the Muslims began to entertain uh, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's greatness by shouting at the top of their voices, Allah is great, Allah is great, there is no God but Allah. And we get this famous hadith where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa told them to lower their voices because you're not calling upon somebody who is deaf. Allah is not deaf. And so he's close to you in all hearing. Okay? And so that's another thing when we're bickering and we're remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we don't have to be like, subhanAllah, subhanAllah. We don't have to do that. You understand what I mean? So alhamdulillah, it is, um, it, it is uh, from this hadith that when we vicar to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we could do it quietly or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can hear us because he's all hearing, right? And so um, the following morning around sun, uh, sunrise, it says that this is the first time that the Muslims, they, they end up encountering the Jews in Khaybar. And um, they had the axes and they spades. So the Muslims caught them by surprise because usually what the Muslims or what the, the Prophet Sallallahu would do, if there was a road that was easily taken, they were waiting for something like that. And on top of that, remember, you would be able to see somebody coming and they traveling during the day. So the Muslims started moving at night. Number one, they didn't go the same route that they would expect for them to go. And then what they ended up doing is they ended up going and traveling at night in stealth. So it said that when they approached the Jews, they were basically out there farming. They had their cattle, they had their axes, they had their spades in terms of being into the ground. So when the Muslims came, they said that they shouted that Muhammad is coming his forces. So the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that Allah is great and Khaybar shall face destruction. Behold, when we descend in the city center, um, it will be a bad day for those who have been warned. Now, <clears throat> subhanAllah, I want to kind of bring back to this. Um, I don't know if the brother who asked this question the last time um, from last week about um, uh, is uh, being forced to become Muslim or else. This is very clear that the Prophet Sallallahu Wasallam had on many occasions tried to have peace with the people around him. And so the Prophet ﷺ had sent countless warnings about the stuff that the, the Jewish tribes was doing and trying to stir up amongst the people adept to fight the Muslims. They had broken truces. They had uh, The Prophet ﷺ was not stupid. So they know exactly as to who is saying what. And, uh, and he used to constantly tell them, listen, y'all need to stop doing this stuff. You need to quit. You need to stop. And so then... It became that when the it was over with, so now they were going full throttle on them. These are enemies, okay? These are not innocent people. These are enemies. And so the Prophet 
he chose a certain um, plot of land and he deemed it suitable in order for them to encamp in. So another Sahaba named Huban, uh, Ibn al-Mundir, he suggested that um, under war requirements uh, for the sake of providing mass, uh, um, maximum logistics, he told the Prophet Sallallahu listen, let's move in another place. And this is another uh, another example because I remember a brother asked when the Prophet Sallallahu would make plans uh, with war, was Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala telling him to be and to go to these particular places? So we now, once again, here's another example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam making a decision and another veteran fighter coming to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and say, Ya Rasulullah, if this is something that Allah told you to do, then boom, this is what we do. But I got another, I, have a, I think I have a better um, way that we can do something in this situation. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would listen if it was a better situation. And so, um, on approaching the camp, or approaching and getting ready to get into it, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam makes this beautiful du'a. And he says, O Allah, Lord of the seven heavens and what you um, harbor beneath, Lord of the seven earths and what lies in their wombs, Lord of the, uh, of the devils and whomsoever they have led astray, we beseech you to grant us the good of this village, Haybar, the good of its inhabitants and the good that lies in it. We seek refuge with you from the evil of this village the evil of its inhabitants and the evil that lies in it. And then he ordered, now march towards the village in the name of Allah. So Alhamdulillah, the getting the Muslims is hyped up now. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he's, make, he's making this dua and they're getting ready to in, encounter um, the enemy. So the banner that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he wanted to give it to, everybody was hyped about who would give it. And then he says a statement, would be this would be entrusted to a man who loves Allah and his messenger, Sallallahu Wasallam, and they love him. And all of the Muslims said came forth hoping, and the Prophet Sallallahu Wasallam gave the banner to no other than our beloved Ali ibn Abi Talib to carry the banner to with Islam. And subhanAllah, Ali is hyped up and he makes a statement that he said he's gonna fight the enemies until they embrace Islam. So the Prophet Sallallahu says something beautiful. He says, um, take things easy and, say, and invite them to accept Islam and be brief uh, and, and brief them on their duties towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And swear by Allah that if only one should be guided through your example, that will surely outweigh the best of camels. So Alhamdulillah, once again, this is another example. The Prophet Sallallahu is teaching um, the Sahaba and teaching us is this is an encouragement for uh, um, uh, uh, teaching people to do good. So we're not harsh with people in terms of we want them to become Muslim. So we're not harsh with them, that we invite them to accept Islam and that we brief them on their responsibilities towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if a person is guided as far as you giving them dawah and an individual accept Islam, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that it would outweigh the best of our camels. And we know that that is a, um, an example uh, or a comparison because camels were very expensive and very valued in their society. Okay. And so it says that Haber, it was split into two parts and it had five um, forts. So it's two parts, five forts. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what he did is he reduced um as far as whatever the strongholds were. So the minor strongholds, that's the one that he, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam attacked first. So, the, so they would get to the bigger one later. So these minor forts, that's the ones that the Muslims would go to um, first and they would deal with and conquer those first. So it said that they actually, when they went to go fight these people, they were actually very formidable enemies. So it wasn't like that this was an easy win. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, for him, Amir, that it's a double reward in the hereafter. And he indicated that by putting his two fingers together, and Ali ibn Abi Talib then undertook to meet uh, Marhab in combat and he managed to kill him. So once again, the, the um, tradition of the Arabs before a major battle would ensue, they would call the people out and they would, might have a duel with each other. And in this situation, Ali ends up killing this individual named Morhab, 
uh, in combat on the one in one combat. So it says that uh, um, uh, the real fight broke out and it lasted for a couple of days. And so it said that the Jews actually showed a lot of courage and they proved to be a formidable enemy. Um, and it says that they but they later realized that the resistance was basically futile and they began. They abandoned their position. And they started to uh, run basically to uh, another fortress. It's funny. You almost, uh, for those of us in the United States, there's a story that uh, the three, what is it? Uh, the three pigs. And the one house was blown down when the wolf blew one house. The other ones, the pigs went running to the other house. That's exactly what happened in this situation. So the, the house, so the Prophet of Islam, they took this. They abandoned that one. They end up running towards the other um, forts. So it said Al Hubab ibn Al Mundir Al Ansari, he led the attack on this particular fortress, and he laid this uh, and this say the siege for about three days for this particular fortress. And then it's when the when the Muslims stormed that, they got a lot of spoils that was in that particular fortress. Okay, so it looked like it's two. Now they got two down, two fortresses down. Remember, it's five, so they got two down, three more to go. So it says that the victory came in the wake of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's invocation or his dua for Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to help Banu Aslam in their relentless daring attempts to capture that particular fort. Alhamdulillah. So during the process, um, the um, Muslims became extremely hungry. All right. War is expensive and you got a lot of soldiers with you. It's 14. How are you going to feed 1400 men in the desert? SubhanAllah. So another miracle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it said that, um, well, going back a little bit. So what they did, they slaughtered donkeys and it said that they um, began to cook the donkeys. And when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had asked them what was they cooking, they told him that it was domestic donkey. Right. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he told him that he told him to throw that away and um, and wash the cooking pots. And this is where we get the hadith that it's haram for us to eat donkeys. Okay. So then after that, um, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had, uh, through Allah's permission, um, had asked Allah, had made a dua, and the Muslims were able to eat a whole lot of food based upon the miracle from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so it said that a Jewish spy um, who was actually on the side of the Muslims um, told them about a water source. That, um, that was providing this particular fort with water. And he advised them to cut off in order to draw them out of that particular fort. And so um, that's exactly what ended up happening. So the Jews ended up having to come out. Why? Because their water source was gone. And the fierce fighting during which the Muslims and 10 Jews were killed, some Muslims and 10 Jews were killed, but um, that particular fort was eventually conquered. So it says that um, shortly after this, then they moved to, it's called Abbey Castle. So this is a bigger fort. And it's uh, and they barricaded themselves in that. And so the same events occurred. The Muslims besieged that particular site for three days. And um, our our beloved hero, our Sahaba, Abu Dajana, the red turban of death is what they would call it. And he had that red turban on. And alhamdulillah, he was able to um, destroy that particular fort as well. And they besieged that one. So um, it said that the Jews uh, wouldn't come out and they wouldn't fight the Muslims. So the Prophet of Islam considered this situation. This is the big fort. He considered the situation and he ordered that rams be used. And it proved effective because it started cracking the, the uh, probably door or whatever that particular thing in the fort was, it started to crack. And so they started to have access, easy access um, in terms of getting into there. So the Jews started fleeing from all directions and they left their women and their children there, right? And so with these uh, military victories, the first division was totally reduced and the Jews and the other minor fortresses evacuated and they fled to the second division. Okay? So this is the second part of Khaybar. And when it said the Prophet 
and his army came, they laid a heavy siege for 14 days. So remember, the other ones were like three days here, three days at this one. three. No, this one, it took them 14 days. And they barricaded themselves in this particular fort. And um, they realized that they was, they was jammed up. So they started asking the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam um, to negotiate with them. And so now there was some, in terms of difference of opinion, and Ibn Ishaq, who is a, uh, a famous scholar, he clearly states that El Hamus uh, fort was conquered by force. So basically, the, the difference of opinion was, was part of Khaybar um, conquered, the three was they conquered by force. And so one scholar's opinion is that it was conquered by force, and others maintain that three of the forts were taken by, um, three, three of the forts were taken through peaceful negotiations. So there were some peaceful negotiations and there were some that was taken by force and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always knows best. And so the negotiation was, is that um, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa agreed to spare their lives on the condition that they evacuate the Khaybar and, um, and the adjacent land, leaving whatever gold and silver that they had in their possessions. However, he stipulated that he would disavow so he would break this contract if they committed or concealed anything from them, from, from them. Okay? And so it says shortly afterwards, the force was handed over to the Muslims and all the Haybar was, um, uh, was in the hands of the Muslims. Now, there was a situation, a person by the name of Kinanan uh, bin Abi Rabia, he um, was hiding something. So he was hiding his treasure and he was lying about that he did it. So the Muslims basically found out that he lied about it. So they killed him for, for breaking that vow. Because the only reason why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told him that he was spared a life, he was very, very clear as to what the conditions were. They broke that condition so one of them got killed. And then um, another person, uh, the, the, the chief, um, Abi Al-Huqa'iq, his two sons was killed um, for breaching the covenant as well. And Safiya, who was um, Huye's daughter, was taken as a captive. Okay? So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he divided the land of Kabar into two. So on one half to provide um, one half to provide the food to be stored in the case of any accidental calamity uh, that might befall the Muslims and for entertaining the foreign delegates who um, started to frequent Medina a lot. Perfect um, plan for this to happen. And um, and the other half will go to the Muslims who had witnessed Hudaybiya and um, event whether they were present or absent. So the total nu uh, nu number of shares came to 36, of which 18 were given to the people above mentioned. And the army consisted of 1,400 men, of whom 200 horsemen, and the horsemen were allotted three shares and the footmen one. OK, so I think that, too, subhanAllah, this is this is a very smart move on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's part in terms of him giving money to the people who were at uh, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. Because remember, they were very, very upset at the, that um, at, at that treaty. You know, they felt that they took a, a loss in that. And so, alhamdulillah, the fact that they got a share of this um, this fortune that the Muslims now came upon, alhamdulillah. It's a great way of dispelling shaitan out of anybody's heart of anything. Okay? Alhamdulillah. So on their return to Medina, <coughs> on the return to Medina, the immigrants also were able um, to return and gave gifts to the people in Medina. Alhamdulillah. Because once again, we know that um, when the Prophet Wasallam would leave, somebody had to be on defense of the city. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would always leave somebody in charge. Okay? So it also it coincided with um, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's cousin Jafar ibn Abi Talib and his companions um, ibn Al Musa al Ashari and some of the Muslims from Abyssinia. Okay? So they end up coming around this time. So Abu Musa al Ashari, he narrated that um, he and 50 companions were in Yemen. And they took a ship which landed them in Abyssinia. And they happened to meet Jafar there. Alhamdulillah. They see their brothers in Islam. 
And he said that we stayed together until the Prophet وسلم, sent an envoy asking for them to come back. Okay, because remember we talked about um, the Prophet وسلم, when he wrote the letter to Negus, he also asked um, for um, the king to send back the companions that they could come to Medina now and they didn't have to have asylum in Abyssinia anymore. And said, they said, when we returned, we found that we had already been, um, that they conquered Haber. So those particular Sahabas had missed out on that particular battle dealing with Haber. So, um, Safiya, whose husband was Kinanan, he was killed for the treachery that he did. And so she was taken as captive, she was a war captive. And so after the permission of the Prophet Sallallahu was sought, um, one person chose to have her as a captive. And so the other Muslims um, advised that Safiya, because of the fact that she came from, um, even though she was, um, her tribe was like an enemy to the Muslims, but she came from a very, um, her bloodline was a very, very um, prestigious. She was the daughter of um, the chief of Banu Quraidha and Banu Nadir. Okay, so it said that she should be married. She shouldn't be married just to anybody. Somebody of her status needs to be married to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so this is the Muslims were trying to were um, in agreement, and they told the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that Ya Rasulullah, you need to marry her. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam agreed, and he freed her, and he took her um, uh, as a wife, and she had embraced Islam. Alhamdulillah. And it said that the wedding feast consisted of dates and fat. Obviously, fat was something that was cool when they was eating, but alhamdulillah, it was dates and fat. And um, this was on their way back to Medina, alhamdulillah. And so after the conquest of Khaybar, and this is a, um, something that I used to hear, all of us who grew up Muslim, we used to hear this story about this individual. Her name was Zainab bin Haritha, and she offered the Prophet Sallallahu Wasallam a roasted sheep, and she poisoned it, right? And so the Prophet Sallallahu Wasallam, he took a mouthful of it, and he spit it out, right? He didn't like it. He spit it out. And after they investigated, um, the woman confessed that she had stuffed it with, with poison. And she alleged that if, if, if the eater were a king, she would then rid herself of him. But if he was a prophet, then he would be bound to learn about it, right? So I don't know if this was her twisted way to see if he was a king or a prophet, but she tried to poison the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And... Um, Actually, one of the other Sahabas had ate this poison and he died from it. And so she was um, executed for trying to poison. She killed a Muslim and trying to poison the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So there was um, a difference of opinion as it relates to the amount of people who were killed or martyred. So between 16 to 18 Muslims and the conquest of Khaybar, they were um, uh, martyred. And the Muslims killed about 93 of the Jewish um, tribes in, in, in Haber. So it said that the rest of Haber, it also fell to the Muslims. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cast fear in the hearts of the people of Fadak. And it's a, so this was a village in the north of um, Haber. And they, of course, when they seen everybody else falling and being um, taken and losing the battle, that they went and they asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for peace. And he allowed them to leave in, um, in safety as long as they left and gave up all of their wealth. Okay. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi um, entered an agreement with them, similar to a previous um, one that he had with the people of Heba. And um, Afadak was exclusively the prophets because neither Muslim nor Calvary um, were involved in the fight. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi got all of the spoils from that particular village or that particular area because they basically was like look we don't want any smoke from from the muslims let's negotiate i don't want to die we don't want our kids to be taken as captives our wives anything we give up and so the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, alhamdulillah instead of executing them like a lot of other people probably would have he said it's cool just go ahead leave your wealth and, and you're good to go so it said no sooner had the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, had dealt with the um, affair in Haber, he started moving moving towards an area called Wadi al Qura, and it was another Jewish colony that was there. Okay, not as big as Haber, but it was still um, 
it was an issue. Okay. And so he mobilized forces. He divided them into three um, regiments with four banners. And this was um, entrusted to Sa'ad ibn Ubaidah and um, uh, Al-Hubab ibn Mundir and uh, Sahal ibn Hanif. And so it says prior to fighting, he invited the Jews to embrace Islam. And but all of that fell on deaf, ear, deaf ears. They didn't want to deal with it. So 11 of the Jews were killed one after another. And each one of them, um, uh, a fresh call was um, still after they was killed. The Muslims still invited them to accept Islam. And so it said they went on fighting ceaselessly until approximately this for about two days. And it resulted in a full surrender of that particular Jewish colony. And it said that a lot of spoils fell into the hands of the Muslims from that particular situation. So you know what, subhanAllah, it really shows us how much they really benefited off of the fitna of what they were able to cause the Aus and the Khazraj. Because they had great, a great amount of wealth from the destruction of the Arabs destroying themselves. Okay? And so um, when the Muslims had overtaken all of these particular forts in these areas, they were able to um, Islam, the Islamic State started to grow exponentially in terms of the resources because they had money and the Muslims themselves who might have been poor, very poor. Medina was not a rich, thriving place to be. It was very difficult when the Muslims had come from Mecca, had migrated from Mecca to Medina. It was a very difficult place to be. You understand what I mean? It wasn't it wasn't easy. So now you have people who at one time was really struggling. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is enriching them from these particular battles and they are starting to get money. And alhamdulillah, we're going to talk about an example of that from our, uh, I think I want to say probably in uh, next week or the week after when we're dealing with the battle of Tabuk and our beloved Hab Ibn Malik. Because that was a situation in dealing with him. So the jewels of Ta'am, uh, Ta'ama, um, her, um, hearing beforehand about the successful victories that the Muslim um, army and defeats of their brother and the Jews, um, uh, they, on the contrary, they took the initiative. So they were smart enough, like, look, we they went to the Prophet Sallallahu to writ for a treaty. So they weren't stupid. They said, look, we're going to try to get a treaty going before you even come here and conquer us and everything else. So they told the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi um, that uh, it, it said that they, they made a, they made a treaty and they, they would pay for protection and they would pay a tribute in, um, in return of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Muslims not doing anything, uh, anything to them. So having achieved um, this particular objective, now the Jews were totally subdued. So I want us to think about this. We looked at the Treaty of Hudaybiyah as being a lost for the Muslims in the beginning, or they looked at it like that. They could have never achieved Allahu Akbar. But if they're fighting the Quraysh, if they're fighting this tribe, fighting this tribe who's with the Quraysh, if they find it, how could they concentrate on fighting this other enemy that was a closer threat to them than the Quraysh were? Okay? So alhamdulillah, the, the treaty actually gave them the advantage of being able to concentrate on a problem more than they would have been able to do a year or two prior to that. Okay? So um, now they're totally subdued. Khaybar, gone. Banu Nadir, gone. Um, uh, Banu Quraida, gone. These other little colonies and Jewish tribes, gone. All this, So now the Prophet وسلم, the Muslims is in full security. And I want to reiterate again, anybody who is listening, because I know that our, our listening um, forum is getting bigger now. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he came into Medina, he came on a mission of peace and everybody who lived in the area to sign a peace treaty with each other and be able to live in harmony. He offered that to them. They agreed to it and they broke it. So I want us to understand that. Okay. And so. Um, it says that uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on his way back uh, um, to Medina, and this is around Rabi Awal, this is the seventh year of Hijri, um, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam being the best among the uh, experts, he realized readily in terms of evacuating Medina 
during Muharram, uh, Dhul Qadr, and Dhul Hijjah would not be wise with the presence of desert Bedouins roaming in the vicinity. Now, what are those? Those are sacred months. So he figured in terms of them being, would violate that, and he was not going to leave the, the Muslims unguarded and think that these people wouldn't do anything to them. This is around a time that they would be looting and piracy in this particular situ uh, in, in this situation. Because they still, you got to remember something. The, 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 there were thousands of these people in this land. This is not like, oh, it's, it's the, a vast desert and there's 10,000 people here. There might be 5,000. No, these was probably hundreds of thousands of people that occupied this land. So threats were always around the Muslims, period. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he, um, uh, in order to deal with this mob, because they were known for uh, plundering and looting and acts of piracy, he um, sent out uh, 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 Aban Ibn Sa'id at the head of a platoon, and this was to deter the Bedouins um, for any type of attempt that they may have in terms of trying to attack the Muslims during the uh, during the Muslims um, stay in Haber. So once again, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is thinking ahead. So it's anything. Sometimes you have people when you try to establish yourself as the baddest, baddest dude on the block. If you know that there's other bad dudes on the block, sometimes you have to be preemptive and you have to deal with you have to be offensive and not defensive. And because of the fact that they knew their people and what they were capable of, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam knew that this is probably a time that when we're gone fighting this enemy, they're going to try to take advantage and doing whatever. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was preemptive and he went and he had them deal with these Bedouins to make sure that they understood that you're not going to attack us and there's going to be repercussions if you do so. Okay? And so Alhamdulillah, they were able to successfully um, conquer these particular um, people who had the thought of doing that. So after Haber, um, there was about several other sporadic invasions. Um, I was probably like maybe eight or nine, seven, like seven or eight um, um, sporadic invasions that the Muslims would, was dealing with. And alhamdulillah, through all of those, the Muslims were victorious and all of those and a large amount of money um, ended up coming into their hands as a result of that. So alhamdulillah, now we get into Umrah. Remember, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah is that they had couldn't perform Umrah that year. And so when they could come to Umrah, they could only come for three days. And then they had to leave, right? And so when Dhul Qadr um, came or was approaching, and this is, a, this is again around the seventh um, year of Hijri, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he ordered his people, especially those who witnessed um, Hudaybiyah, the ones who, who witnessed the truth, he definitely told them, listen, we're about to go um, to Umrah, and so everybody get ready. So to make preparations, um, he proceeded with about 2,000 men, and it was some women and some children. So it was about 60 camels they took with them for sacrifice in order to visit the um, holy city of Mecca, alhamdulillah. And so it said that the Muslims, they took their weapons, they're not stupid, they took their weapons fearing that the Quraysh um, would be treacherous in this truce. It's not like the Quraysh is not beneath something like that. They don't have any fear of Allah in terms of breaking a treaty. So the Prophet Wasallam and the Muslims were, they, they were strapped, basically. You know, they came, they were strapped, they had they had their weapons, they was ready for whatever was going to happen, but alhamdulillah, so this is what the Prophet Wasallam did. So he left um, with about 200 people, he told them to stay back in a particular area, right? And he, they left all of their weapons with them. So if a situation was going on, they probably was close enough where they could go get the weapons if something happened or those Muslims who had stayed behind had weapons and then they can come and they can assist and do whatever they needed to do. So they came um, into the confines of Mecca with swords, but they were in there um, sheets or what they call them uh, scarabs or something like that. But it was they their um, swords were um, sheathed and um, they came and they performed the um, the Umrah. 
So it says that the Quraysh had left. Now they was disgusted at seeing this. So they left and they would go to uh, their tents outside or adjoining hills. And the Muslims would perform the, um, the circumambulation. And they did it vigorously and briskly. The reason the Prophet ﷺ told him to do this is because he wanted them to appear to be strong, right? He wanted them to appear to be strong and um, because there was a rumor that was spread in Medina uh, or they, people had spread a rumor in Medina that the Muslims had um, been weak because of uh, some type of uh, like a fever, a real bad fever had was coming through Medina, some type of calamity or sickness. And it was this rumor that they had been greatly affected and that their strength was uh, would be basically they wouldn't have any strength. So imagine like hmm, this rumor. We hear this rumor that they weak. They come in here. This might be a perfect opportunity or whatever to attack them. This would maybe going through some of their minds. So the Prophet Sallallahu said they came. They got their ikhrams on. Their shoulder is out. They might be muscles might have been beaming. Allah knows best. And they're running, okay? So or they're going really fast around the uh, around the Kaaba. So subhanAllah, that rumor is over and done with. So if they had some type of thinking that they might do something to the Muslims, that was a done deal now, okay? So they were ordered to run the first three rounds, which is something that we do even to this day, and walk the remaining um, circumambulation. So with seven times you go around the Kaaba and you run if you can, you try to go faster than you usually would um, in the uh, around the Kaaba. SubhanAllah, so many Muslims now. You know, we try to do the best that you can, especially if you're making Hajj. You, it's not you're not gonna be able to run too much. Maybe you could walk a little bit, but you know, it's hard to run. And so um, the Meccans, they went on top of these particular mountains, and they were watching the Muslims. And they couldn't believe the strength and the devotion that is uh, that the Muslims have with Islam. OK. And Alhamdulillah, this was um, this revolutionary because what they considered an Umrah, they had all kind of idols around and they would be sacrificing and wiping blood on so-called football and Uzzah and Lot and <coughs> all of these other different idols. So when they see the Muslims doing what they're doing, it's like they can't believe it. And so it said when they entered the holy sanctuary, Abdullah ibn Rawaha, another famous Sahabi, um, walked before the Prophet Wasallam, and he's reciting, get out the way, oh, you disbelievers, make way. We will fight you. Uh, um, we will fight you about its revelation with strokes uh, that will remove heads from shoulders and make friend unmindful of friend. Alhamdulillah. <clears throat> and then it says after the ritual, between them running between Safa and Marwa, um, the Prophet وسلم, he halted at a later spot and they slaughtered and they sacrificed animals and they shaved their heads, alhamdulillah. And so the main body of the pilgrims um, who had now performed the basic rites of the lesser pilgrimage um, uh, remain those who were entrusted in charge of the weapons. So the Prophet وسلم, had them relieved the 200 Right. So they relieved. There was 200 that behind. Now that the other Muslims had um, performed their the rituals with they, they want to go relieve the other Muslims so they could come and they could perform the Umrah. Alhamdulillah. And um, so in the morning on the fourth day of the pilgrimage. Uh, they they told them that, listen, it's time to go. They was they were sick of the Muslims being there. You know what I mean? So they told them it was a violation. You know, we said that you were supposed to be here for three days. And so um, they told this to Ali ibn Abi Talib and the Prophet, of course, not wanting to violate a treaty. Um, they ended up leaving. But they went to a village that was kind of nearby. So it wasn't they weren't in Mecca. So they did not violate the, the, the treaty. But they stayed at a place called Sarif. And they stayed there. The Muslims stayed there for some time. Uh, Allah knows best how long. Um, there's no sources to say how long they stayed there. But they did honor the agreement of them staying there for only three days. And they went to this particular place. So some military operations um, um, was directed at some obstinate um, Arab, de some desert Arabs. OK, so it took place um, in the conclusion around the lesser pilgrimage time. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 
a platoon of about 50 men led by uh, Ibn Abi al-Awja. Uh, and he was dispatched by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to the habitations of Banu Salim, inviting them to embrace Islam. And all of the words, it fell on deaf ears. They didn't accept it. And it said that fierce fighting erupted between the two parties and the Muslim leader was wounded and the two of the enemy was captured. So Alhamdulillah, that's how that one went. Then it was another one where um, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam dispatched 200 men and um, they killed some rebels. And they and once again, they ended up getting a lot of spoils from that particular situation. And then it said that um, uh, Banu Qudah, uh, Banu Qudaa had gathered a large um, number of men to raid Muslim positions. And on hearing the news, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he dispatched a Sahaba um, at the head of about 15 men to deal with this situation. And they encountered the army and they told them or they invited them to accept Islam. And it said that the rebels gave a negative response and they showered the Muslim with arrows, um, killing all of them except for uh, one who was carried back home and later seriously wounded. So alhamdulillah, this is some of the, this is pretty much, we'll deal with the conclusion of um, this class today and dealing with Khaybar and dealing with, um, dealing with Khaybar and um, uh, the, the, the Umrah that they made. So inshallah, alhamdulillah, the floor is open for any, uh, any questions. Wait a minute. Trying to get my mic. Can you guys hear me? And there's no echo, I hope. Yeah, I want, the brother wants to know um, here. He said, I'm trying to read this right. Do we have to, when making Hodge, do we have to do that fast run? It's encouraged. It's sooner to do it. You know, I mean, if you got a, a problem with your knees or your legs or your ankles or anything like that, then no. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, but it's it's, so, it's sooner to do it. But honestly, if um, in, in the climate, it's so many people on Hajj. I don't really see how anybody could could do that anyway. You might be able to run between Safa and Malawa at a particular times um during the Umrah time, but um, it's so packed. I, when I made Hajj, it was four million people there. You know, so um, it's it's sooner to do it. Um, is is your Hajj going to be or your Umrah invalidated? If you don't do it, I've never read any source that your Hajj or your Umrah is invalidated if you don't do that. Okay. Okay. Bethany wants to know why did they stay at Bethany. the? Yeah, she's what, Bethany's at it. She wants to know why did they stay at the other place? Um, th that no one knows how long they stayed. What what was the purpose of them staying there? Why didn't they go back to Medina? Um, you know, it's it's about just 2,000 of them. Um, and, you know, alhamdulillah, it could also be a strategy from the Prophet of Allah Wasallam for them to, to look at their strength even more. You know what I mean? Because the, the Quraysh knew exactly where they were, you know, and so it could be a situation of, listen, we we not we just not ready to roll yet. It could be they wasn't ready to roll. They might have had some business somewhere close by and or. It's to see the, the for them to still see the presence. And, you know, if, if we remember from the, some of the other classes, right, when the Prophet Sallallahu had captured um, one of it was a person who was an enemy to them. So what happened was that he ended up um, he ended up uh, see he chained them to the pillar of the mosque and this person stayed amongst them for some time. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi released them. So now they seeing them interact as Muslims and this had an effect on certain people. So when they saw the Muslims and how they was interacting with each other, they saw how they were interacting with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Some people even called Ibn Walid's brother. That's one of the ways that he accepted Islam because he was a captive in the Battle of Badr and he saw how the Muslims were, were, uh, were acting towards each other and it touched his heart. So a lot of times when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did something, there was some strategic situation with that. Uh, it doesn't go in detail as to why they did it, but it could be a situation of that they had people that they just, it was a lot of them. Um, they just might be wanting to stay there for a minute. Maybe they had some business and maybe they wanted the Quraysh to see, uh, this, to observe them or people from those vicinities, observe them even more. Because, you know, they, they, the, now they, the, they, they're the most loved
feared, and now and I would say hated people in the region. So the people who were polytheists, they hated them and they respected them at the same time. You know, because the people, they, they're Muslims are accomplishing things that they never ever have seen before in their life, ever. They're accomplishing all kind of stuff that they never seen. So alhamdulillah. So now that they're accomplishing these things, and it's like, man, this of uh, just respect. So you know, the Muslims had a lot of eyes on them. You know, so it doesn't really go in detail as to why that particular way, but the Prophet Sallallahu did not violate that agreement and they stayed pretty much on the outskirts. Wherever that place is, it's close to it must be close to Mecca where they didn't violate the, the treaty or the agreement. She she also says <clears throat> the strategy that he used was so amazing. Did the angel Gabriel inspire him to do these things? Yeah, remember, we don't have any um, evidence of that um, because one of the um, one of the uh, a, a kind of couple situations, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a, a was just a, a he's a military leader. Alhamdulillah. This is another thing as to why when he was picked as the most influential person in history, because when you look at all of the other, even religious figures, they didn't never do anything close to what the Prophet Sallallahu did. He's a father, he's a general, he's a statesman, he was a, 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 a religious leader, I mean, he was a husband, he was a father, all of these things embodied the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so, but he had certain positions that he took and Sahaba would say, oh, you know what, Messenger of Allah, what about this? You know, what, what, what is this? What is this? What about this? I think that we'd be better positioned if we did this. I think we'd be in a better position if we did that. And sometimes they, he would go along with the other people's suggestion. But to answer, to go further to your question, I don't, I've never, I haven't read any sources in terms of even the majority of these where the angel Jabril came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, you know, Ya uh, Rasulullah, you know, put position the troops over here. Allah wants you to position the troops over here and Allah wants you to put them over here and Allah wants you to do this. We don't, I don't see any evidence of that. Okay. And so Alhamdulillah, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a natural leader. Now there was verses of the Quran that was revealed from the angel Jabril to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about events that was taking place or an event that was getting ready to take place. But as far as the strategy of this is where you put this and you know, all of this other stuff, because remember, we just talked about in the battle of Haber that it was a Jew uh, who was a spy for the Muslims that had came out and told them how to jam up their water um, supply. Uh, somebody else told the Prophet Islam to do that. And then that's how they did it. And they forced them to come out and fight. And that's how they took the fort. So that's so inshallah, I hope that that kind of clarified that. <laughs> she said one more question what about sure. the angel mike michael she said michael really? is the angel of war he didn't contribute at all no that's not that's a um i don't believe that's an islamic concept yeah just you have the art uh, you have uh main angels you know mikhail is what you're talking about you know and so um allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the in the quran that angels, um, they they did, and especially in the Battle of Badr, they did. Um, they did. Hold on for one second. The line is being. Brother Mota, can I ask a question? 
Yes, I wanted to ask, I don't know if you already said it, do, um, is it a sunnah whenever you go to the um, orma for the man to cut their hair? Yes, that's, that's, that's sunnah. In, in terms, so it, there's part of the ritual that you have to, you can either shave your hair or you can um, cut a piece of it off. But that's part of the that's that's part of the, the um that's part of the um ritual of performing umrah. Or, or, okay, you know, and that's and just and hajj too. Okay, and that's just only for men, right? No, a woman just can cut a, a little piece off. She don't <laughs> no, the sisters don't have to go baldini. They don't have they don't have to do that. They just cut a, a little piece off. But for the men, they either shave their hair bald because there was a, a, a hadith. That, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that basically um, you get like more of the reward um, of shaving your hair bald compared to just kind of cutting a piece off, you know? Because, okay, like, okay. Like, like, so for instance, when I made, um, when I made Hajj and Umrah, the majority of the time when you make Umrah, um, or I'm saying when you make Hajj, a lot of times we pray, we make Umrah first, right? And then you get into the Hajj and so on and so forth. So um, when I made Umrah, because I knew that the Hajj part was going to come, and so I had my hair. So I, when I made Umrah, I got some scissors. It cut a little piece, like whatever hair that I had left at the time. You understand? Cut a little piece of my hair off. And then, inshallah, I knew with the intention that I was going to perform um, I was going to perform Hajj, and so I could totally cut my head bald. You know what I mean? So some people do that. Um, they they do that, but you can cut a piece of your hair, and or you can um get uh, or cut your hair bald. Um, e either one is is cool. Okay, thank you. Alhamdulillah. Okay, so um, with Sister Bethany, I think that's what she had asked me. So um, no, we know that in Allah tells in the Quran in the Battle of Badr that Allah did assist the, uh, the, the Muslims with angels, um, so on and so forth, but a particular angel, and as a matter of fact, um, if I'm not mistaken, the angel Jabril was on the battlefield with the Muslims in the Battle of Badr, um, and, uh, but as far as a specific angel um, being sent as like, this is the angel of war, so on and so forth, I, and, uh, and Allah knows best. I could be wrong, but I don't think that that's... Uh, in terms of that's a, a angel that's responsible for war in Islam, I don't I don't think so. Okay. Okay, that's all Any I have from questions? from Zoom. Uh, that's all I have from Facebook, uh, YouTube people. Uh, the way I got the cameras working, you can type your question and it'll appear up on the screen. So everybody can see on the side. I like that. That's cool. And then <laughs> Zoom, y'all can take the mic. Okay, one of the brothers, the new Shahadas on Facebook. Brother Abdullah, he says, um, mashallah, he has this book. This book is very difficult to follow, but he <laughs> likes how you are putting it together. He said, how do you do that? I, I like to credit my Omi. Alhamdulillah, may Allah bless her. <laughs> Same with me my, too. My, my, my mother was a school teacher for 36 years. And my abu is an imam, so I, I got the best of, of uh, in terms of being able to. You you can thank my abu in terms of me putting it in a way that y'all can understand, <laughs> and in terms of put getting the information together, you know, um, putting it together. You can uh, thank my own may uh, 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 make dua for my my mother. Yeah, alhamdulillah. She, I I kind of credit her with that one. And by the way, guys, his mother and father were my teachers. His mom taught me. That's how we. Got that history of Islam together. His mom was into that history, and his father, may Allah bless Imam Mutawaf. Y'all know him. Yes, yeah, subhanAllah. Yeah, so alhamdulillah. So that's 
that's um yeah so that, but i understand you know sometimes too I'm, i um, brother you know sometimes also uh because what i plan on doing even after re- with this particular book um probably when i'm talking about even when i did a series about the stories of the companions uh when i did a story about the stories of companions or whatever i um would sometimes look at three and four different sources and you i would cross reference them to make sure because some things have more information than others and um some things have more information than others you know what i mean so uh you can you can do that as well but i definitely if you don't have i can understand what you're saying as far as especially with all of the names and you know you're a new muslim and you're trying this person is related to this person this person that you know so on and so forth so no i definitely understand what you're saying <laughs> yeah, alhamdulillah and so you know and sometimes too you have to kind of read you you read stuff you may have to read a line like three or four times you know to try to make sure that um that you read that whatever you read that is that is correct. So yeah, so alhamdulillah, that's more so that's how I try to uh I've always been able to to do that. Any other um questions? Okay, go ahead, Sabrine. What was, what was the uh name of this this war again? This is the Battle of, of Khaybar. Khaybar, uh K H A some I've, I've seen this spell K H A Y B A R and or K H A I B A R, the Battle of Haber. Uh, could you, so how long did it go on? Because it seems like it went on for a long time. Yeah, it took, a, it seemed like each fort, so it seemed like it was about five forts. So it said that, um, it said that, uh, um, one fort was three days. Another fort is um three days. Another fort was another three days, and then they end up coming to another one that was like fourteen. So they definitely had a situation where they um they definitely had a situation where they were there for a while. It wasn't an easy. It was not an easy win for them to be able to go into these um this fort of these castles and take their forts and castles over. They weren't able to do that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. It doesn't, it doesn't seem like it would be. Yeah. And they weren't, they were, they were, it was giving them a run for their money for a minute. You know, but alhamdulillah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's um, you know, their love for Allah, their determination. And you gotta remember something too, brothers and sisters. One of the reasons why the Muslims were so um successful. At doing what they did is because their whole mission was about Allah and his messenger. It wasn't for money. That just kind of was like, oh, but that wasn't the drive. Their drive was to make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's word supreme. Allah blessed them. That's just a offshoot. They weren't mercenaries where their whole thing, oh, you know, that was the other tribes thing. They were like, Ratafan, they were like mercenaries. Oh, you know, you give us what you fight with us. You know, we'll give you half the yield for a year. We'll give you this kind of money and you can have these slaves. And they, they was in it for that stuff. But alhamdulillah, the Muslims, 99% of the time, during the time of the Prophet Wasallam, they were usually always outnumbered. And usually they always was successful. And so when they did things for the pleasure of Allah and they were doing stuff in order to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then they would definitely... Um, they would definitely come up with a situation of success because they was in it for the right reason. Anytime we start doing stuff for something other than the pleasure of Allah, a lot of times it will, it usually, it'll, it'll fail. It had to have a lot of stuff in there. And if you're using like trying to feel it on this is Islam and your real reason is some other type of worldly situation. But when you do something for the pleasure of Allah, Allah will open up doors for you from things that you didn't even think about happening to you because you went into it with a with the right type of intention. Okay? And mm-hmm. so we, we've talked about the Battle of Badr 
they was outnumbered. The Battle of Uhud, they was outnumbered. The Battle of Handak, they was outnumbered. The Battle of Haybar, they were outnumbered. The Battle of Quraida, they were outnumbered. They were always outnumbered. Uh, and, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made them victorious because they had the right mindset. They was together, they was brothers, and their only mission was to spread the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That was, that was it. And alhamdulillah, all of the other stuff, the money and everything else, that came as a, that was a bonus. <laughs> that was a bonus. You know? So, so alhamdulillah. Any other questions? Zakallah, Kim. Barakallah, Fiqh. Alhamdulillah. Was it the habit of the Muslims to take booty or slave or treasure and victory? Well, yeah, that, that honestly, that was the that was the understanding throughout the, the beginning of time almost. That's always been the understanding. You know, when you when you lose a, a, a war, that um yeah, you took people's stuff. You know, that was that's always the understanding. And and almost you think of any society, that was always the understanding. The difference was, you know, the beautiful thing about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we've talked about uh at least three occasions when he could have did that, and he actually no, it was yeah, three or four occasions where he actually conquered some people and he let them go free. You know, in the past, that would not have happened. And we know in America that even when a, a slave accepted Christianity, they still was uh, was a slave. Only thing they told them, and they, they read a, the Bible to them and told them how they needed to be a better slave. You understand what I'm saying? But when a person accepted Islam, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he freed them. When they embraced Islam, he freed them. And it was a situation where the Muslims had taken, they defeated some people. And I guess one of the leaders had accepted Islam. And he went to the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, I accepted Islam. Prophet Islam gave him all his stuff back. All the captives, all the all the stuff, that he gave it back to him. So that, once again, that lets you know that the Muslims was not in it for them. That was, a, that was just a kind of a bonus. But they weren't doing anything that was out of the norm of what societies have been doing for a long period of time. You know, that's um, the Persian Empire, the Byzantine Empire, you know, all empires, that's spoils of war. You know, that's what it is. They all, all of them have done that. They take people's stuff. You know what I mean? That's what they did. It's the spoils of war. Okay. 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 Bethany wants to know what exactly <clears throat> was or is war booty? Oh, okay. So when you say the war booty, basically it's the stuff, it's people's stuff. Swords, Gold, maybe silver if they had it, um, cattle, you know, it's people's stuff. That's that's all it is. You know, a house, you know, that's a it, more booty is people's stuff. So when you conquer your enemy and you know, and they lose, they fought against you, tried to kill you, they you know what I'm saying, and everything else, you took their stuff. Their stuff was now your stuff. You know, and uh Billah. You know, when a, a, when a Kufars used to come in there, they would come in there and they would rape women and everything else. The Muslims didn't do that. You know, so the Prophet Islam was like, listen, you can take all, all your women, all your children, you take them all, but you leave all your stuff here. So you, you, you leave with your lives and, you know, you leave with your lives or whatever, but you leave all the rest of your stuff here. You know what I mean? So that's that's what war really is. You know, I, I usually try to say spoils of war, but this is usually the um you know what you take from somebody when you defeat them in a in a battle she said thank you she never understood what that was alhamdulillah no problem anything else another brother said it may sound silly but do we do that today what's that take people's stuff yeah He said, he said he's, hold on. 
Yeah, I'm, I got it. I see it, brother. Hold on. He said he's talking about in wars today, period. He's not necessarily speaking about Muslims. Do they do that today when they fight? Yeah, they do that. Yeah. Yeah, they do that. They, you know, they over here, they went in there and uh, they looted, um, from my understanding, and this is not no conspiracy stuff, you know, because we know other people is listening. You know, I mean, they did that when they went and invaded Iraq. They took all of their gold. They took all of their money. You understand what I'm saying? They, 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 they looted all of their stuff. They took their guns. You know, they, they, yeah, they still do that. You know, subhanAllah, Vietnam was the same thing. And, and, and unfortunately, you know, in terms of we're dealing with history and stuff like that, they took over, unfortunately, in Afghanistan, you know, this, the drug trade. I mean, that's that's that. I mean, that's documented that the, the, there's certain Muslim group that had destroyed the drug trade, you know, for the heroin trade. And all I know is when certain people invaded that area, heroin was boosted all over the world again. You understand? So even something like that. But yeah, they still do that. Yeah, they, they looted. They looted his stuff. They looted his stuff, anything of uh, uh, any other area that they came in. They take all of their stuff. Look at what Israel is doing to the Palestinians. I mean, their stuff is just horrible. They really violate and they violating agreements, you know, but they taking people's houses, you know, and all kind of different stuff they do. So, yeah, no, they still practice that to this day. But. Alhamdulillah, Islam has rule. We have rules. You understand what I'm saying? We can't go and be killing old people and children and you know what I mean? And people who ain't doing nothing. You just, you know, a guy sitting there in the field minding his business and you just shoot him in the head because of the fact that he's of that pretend. That's haram and we can't, we don't do stuff like that. You understand what I'm saying? So, um, you know, subhanAllah, I remember it was a situation uh, when Iraq invaded uh, Kuwait. This is like in the 90s. And it was some situation where I think a brother or there was a Muslim, I guess he sexually assaulted a, a woman and they beat him on the spot. This kind of, we, we have rules. Uh, we, have, we have rules and stuff like that that we follow, even within war. We don't go destroying stuff and just the whole annihilate the earth and like other people that we know. We don't do that. You know what I mean? We have rules to, to, to even how we engage our enemies. You know, we don't torture them. You know, that kind of thing. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, no, they still, they definitely go in other people's countries, wherever they go, other people's countries and they take all of their stuff. Yeah, for sure. He said, thank you so much for breaking that down and giving him understanding. He said, so the saying all's fair in war, he said, is really true then. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 For sure. Yeah, for sure. Now, that I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a it's a horrible it's a horrible situation. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, alhamdulillah. And this is why, you know, I want, you know, um, if I, I've often heard, say, for instance, um, what the Kufar tries to use is this similar to this, this um, to differentiate the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from Isa Alayhi Salaam, right? You know, in terms of this, this whole idea, uh, this whole idea of Christianity, of uh, this comparison between Christianity and Islam, the difference between the Isa Alayhi Salaam and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Salaam, that, you know, Isa was about love and about this. And, uh, yeah, but he didn't. First off, how long was Isa alayhi salam around in terms of preaching whatever he was preaching? And he didn't have a nation that he was dealing with. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam had a nation. They had a state. And they had people coming at them from everywhere. From everywhere. And on top of that, people inside of the religion who was coming from them too. So Isa alayhi salam didn't have nothing even close to what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi was dealing with. Not even close. And in even in that, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi showed compassion when he could have been 
very brutal, and he chose not to do that. You understand what I'm saying? He could have slaughtered all of the people. The Jews have been causing him a problem for years. He could have slaughtered everybody, even when they fought him. What did he do? He allowed them to go. He killed the ones that violated their agreement. You understand what I'm saying? So it's the, so that's the that's the difference. That's the difference. You can't make that comparison. Isa alayhi salam wasn't even married. He didn't have children. He didn't run a state. He didn't have people within doing it. He didn't have none of that. You can, there's no comparison that a person can make, even though we love Isa alayhi salam. You can't be a Muslim if you say he didn't exist. But to make the comparison, there is no comparison between Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There's no comparison. We're going through this journey. We're seeing from the very beginning of where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi started in the beginning, in the in the in the middle, in a little close to the end, and inshallah, we're gonna see the end. In terms of his compassion, his fortitude, his uh his 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 love for people who are Muslim and his mercy towards those who are non-Muslim. But like I said before, we're not a bunch of punks either. You know what I mean? So we're not going to let somebody just do anything to you. Allah gave us the right to defend ourselves. You understand what I'm saying? And that's what, we, that's what the Prophet of Islam and the Muslims were doing. Okay? Any other questions? So hold on. I know I, I see a question. This is, uh, alhamdulillah, this is uh, Brother Adam. And um, alhamdulillah, brothers is listening to us for, in Ghana. So, so uh, Brother Adam asks the question. Um, uh, let's see. Is the true? Is it true the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu family are everywhere in the world, and how are they recognized? And it says, I ask this question because in Africa, uh, there are people who claim that they are descendants of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. My question to that is, Allah knows best, and that there is supposedly. It's interesting that this question was asked because I, I heard something today that Kunta Kente actually is a descendant from Uqba ibn Nafi, who was um, a famous Sahaba. Um, and we all know about the book Roots. Those of us in the United States, African-Americans know about the book Roots by Alex Haley, his descendant Kunta Kente. Kunta Kente was from Gambia and Kunta Kente is supposed to be descended from um, one of the uh, of the. Um, of the Sahabas and so on and so forth. So a person saying that they de uh, descended from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, um, Allah knows best. Unless they can prove that situation, then I mean, what what can we say? I mean, I know there's a lot. I, subhanAllah. I, you know, I've, I've heard this even people in the United States. I don't know how they got that. You know, I don't know how they got that. But um, and I'm not talking about this as somebody that an immigrant coming to the United States. These are people who were born and raised, probably been in the United States for, you know, five generations. And they said that they was the descendant of the prophet. Sallam. Allah knows best. You know, we're just going to say that. But I don't know how you can recognize them. It would be the, the onus of would be on them to prove that they are the descendant of the prophet. Okay. So that that would have to be that, that that's that's how I would answer that question. Excellent, excellent, Mukhtar, mashallah, beautiful. Alhamdulillah. Anybody? Any other questions? I'm trying to read this person's question here. Oh, I'm, he's still typing it. Okay. Oh goodness gracious, guys! I can't see this on this phone. I'm hooked. This is from. Let me. See. I got my contacts on. He said, yes, this is big problem. Ghana. I guess he's in oh. Ghana. Yeah, I'm the Allah. Yeah, I'm the Allah. He said he understood. This this our, our brother, Alhamdulillah, in uh in Ghana. It's a community of Muslims there, and Alhamdulillah, they've been uh they've been listening to the classes, Layla. So Alhamdulillah, they over there in Ghana checking it out. Oh, what's well, subhanAllah. We got a lot of them coming in here. Now I see where, why, yeah. On my call in for Sister Layla, I got ahead a lot of them too. SubhanAllah, mashallah. Okay, welcome, brothers. Yeah, he said big, big problem. Yeah. Yeah, alhamdulillah. You know, people, 
unfortunately. I, I don't know how they get that, but you know, my show won. <laughs> you know, I, I can understand why somebody would want to be. I wish I was, but I have no proof of, of none of that. You know, I have no proof of none of that. So yeah, I don't, I don't know if there, there's like not a, you know, somebody, some divine, like a light shining off of a person, you know, you know, we don't know about none of that, you know. Yeah. I have so. a question not really mm -hmm. related to the subject. Um, it's it, it, either for both of you. Um, so I know Sister Layla said that um, we should learn, like, you know, make our kids choose a companion and then learn about, like, learn about them like she did, like she chose Aisha. So they have someone who they look up to, like a role model. So I'm trying to do that. Mm -hmm. Like, is there, like, a a good site or recommendation where I can buy a like a book for them to like kind of go over that and what companion they choose. Yeah, there's some really, you know what, alhamdulillah for technology, there's some really good, they even have apps now that you can go, I don't know, you have a, um, Android or a, uh, iPhone? The iPhone. Oh, of course. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> alhamdulillah. I think, I know on Android uh, with the Google store, they have more, there's a lot more resources on there. Um, but you can put in something like stories of the of the companions, and a lot of stuff will, will pull up from there. You know, they you I know I, I've seen several uh, in the in the Play Store that you can download, and they have um, each store each thing that you can do in there. Um, but you know, internet not really good. You, yeah, the I only see. Thing, though, you got to be careful about that though. Is is this? I remember. Um, you, the number one, you got to make sure there's a, a, a website called, I think, alislam.org. That's a Shiite website. So you got to be careful not to go on there. There's another one that's an Ahmadiyya website. You got to be careful. that. So when you're looking at some of these, um, these resources, kind of scroll down or where it says about us, look and see what they're, um, what, what they're about. You know what I'm saying? But um, a lot of times, uh, I know for the phone, if you have an a iPad or something like that, you can download some of that stuff and or you can get those apps and they have stories of the companion, each companion. It's like I think I saw one. It was like 50 of them, 50, 60 of them that was on there. And Alhamdulillah, also, we've done on this particular um, on uh, Sunnah followers. There's uh, I, I believe I probably done at least 20 um, companions, you know, and I believe it's in YouTube. And then, inshallah, that's another a resource that you could go and and, and look at that uh, to, to learn about some of the Sahabas as well. Because one of the things that I tried to do is I I, per, I I purposely stayed away from companions that everybody knew about. You know what I'm saying? Um, I, I used to do that. You know what I mean? So, um, I, like Aisha, I didn't talk, everybody knows about Aisha for the most part. Abu Bakr, Umar, you know, I try to talk about Sahabas that a lot of times people didn't know about. Okay, so there's that's another resource that we have it on Sunnah followers and you can go into that resource and the kids can look at the video of us talking, discussing particular companions. Um, and matter of fact, I talked about one that I discussed, Abu Dajana. He's in one of the series on stories of the companions as well. Yeah, that's why I asked because I know um, there's few books where I purchased before and they had some like misinterpretation or like some, some errors in there. So I just wanted to make sure it was like a, a good website for it. But I'll mm -hmm. I'll go keep looking through. Shalom. Okay, any other questions? Uh, brother also asked, is, there, is it um, okay to use Hadith written in Shia or Sufi books? I would stay away from that. Personally, I would stay away from that. You know, so for y'all, I would stay away from that. Um, you guys I remember would, the Shiites got their own books. They don't even believe in right. Bukhari and Muslim. Yeah, y'all leave yeah, them alone. Right. right. Yeah, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't take anything. There's different divisions of Shia and stuff like that. And that's that's a whole nother topic. But at the end of the day, my, my answer is is no, stay away from it.
Any other um, any other questions? My mother says, may Allah bless you. She loves the way you teach. Islam is in your heart and you speak so lovingly to us Muslims and you make the message understanding, especially this warfare. She said, and of course you get that from the Imam. She said, may Allah (laughs) bless you. (laughs) Amen. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Okay. Alhamdulillah. Any other um, questions? Okay. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Okay. So a- anything that, that, that was good, um, anybody got good um, from this particular class, this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And any mistakes that was made is from me. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive me for him. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Wa ashadu anna ilaha ila anta wa astaghfiruku wa atubu alayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Recording stopped.